approval of the minutes from our meetings on September 3rd and September 20th. Do we need to do them separately or do we do them together? Um, no, you could do them together. I actually just noticed something. The, um, I don't think we met on the 20th. I think we met on the 17th. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm sure the minutes are okay. Let me just see if I put the... Um, You know what happened? You might have just done them that day we and the yeah, date rolled in. Okay. So if, if yes, we just modify the, um, the the date from the 20th to the 17th, okay. the minutes themselves are okay. Okay. So you can take them together. All right. I make an motion to approve the minutes of the regular school committee meeting of September 3rd and September 17th, 2019. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Okay. Any corrections or any comments on the minutes? All right. All in favor of approval? Aye. 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 Aye zero. I'll get that fixed. Yep. Should I All right. send an email to Deb? No, I'll just take care of it. Okay. All right. So next up, our Chelm High School representatives. All right. Hello, everyone. These are updates on our school. So first, um, Pride Block started today for the whole school. It's used for extra help, group projects, and it's like a designated learning time. And we do it every Tuesday and Thursday now. So you go to whatever teacher you want during those days, and it's an hour long. It's something that we're um, that we're trying besides plus walk on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then the SATs are on October fifth for Chelmsford, and we also have an early release day on Thursday the tenth, and uh, there is no school on October fourteenth because of Columbus Day, and on October sixteenth the MEFA College Financing Info Night is at six thirty in the pack, and. The first time high element ropes course will be used this Tuesday, the ones around the high school. And the first PTO meeting of the year will be on October 7th at 7 o'clock. Um, the overall sports record is 41, 11, and 3, which is really good. The first home football game was last Friday, and there was a huge turnout. There's a lot of people there. And the girls' swim team is still undefeated, which is awesome. And Finally, the senior class is working with the athletic department for homecoming, and all the proceeds are going to their class. If you don't mind me asking, what do you think of the pride block? Um, so first, for me, today I liked it because I have a test tomorrow, so it was a review session, so that was good for me. I don't know how it will be all the time because I'm not going to have a test the next day all the time, but so far it was not bad for me. Yeah, I agree. I also have a test tomorrow, so it was good that I could go and work with my teacher. But if you don't sign up soon enough, there's not enough room in the class, so then you get assigned to another teacher, maybe someone you don't even have, and it might be inconvenient for you. The only problem for me was I have three tests tomorrow, so I couldn't decide which one. I had to choose one. So. Wow, mean teachers. Yeah. <laughs> so on Pride Block, let's say you have three tests and you want to go to three teachers. Are you allowed to do that? So I don't think you're supposed to do that because you have to go to the teacher that you're assigned to. But maybe if you get like a pass, then you can go. But it's okay. also like it's an hour of time, so I feel like it's better to stay in one one class. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. That's something that we can just as an aside when the high school comes in to do their presentation, yeah, we can make sure that they touch ba um, touch base on that. Okay. Give a little overview. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, good news. And we didn't even overlap. This is awesome. Um, so we do have the high and low rope elements that are going to be used, but I guess at both McCarthy and CHS this weekend, they're going to be installing the um, golf course, which is the disc golf course. So that's all going to be put <coughs> together. So that will be in conjunction with PE that they can go out and use that process. And then our great, this is hot off the presses from the English department. So grade five and nine ELA teachers reported that the one-to-one -one initiative is going well and they're loving the Chromebook. We also have the National English Honor Society students, and they went down to volunteer at the Chelmsford Public Library book sale. And in talking about National Honor Societies, the applications for Science National Honor Society are closed tomorrow, and the first inductee class will be in two weeks. Grade 6 through 12 CPS All Town Wind Ensemble has it for, had its first rehearsal on Wednesday, and there are about 90 students in this group for this year. Um, today, we had Matthew Garante, who was one of, Garante, did I say Garante. that? Yep. Um, one of our PE teachers at CHS, and he received a gift card and basket for making an impact on one of his students in his unified PE class. This gift card can be used to provide additional supplies and equipment for his unified PE class. The award was given by Lions Arc 
based on one of our seniors who wrote an essay about Matt's class from last year. Lions Arc provides seniors with scholarships from their essay submissions every year and also in turn provides the person the student writes about an award for an act of kindness. Um, Dr. Whittlesey has been chosen by DESC to be one of the arts education ambassadors. Ambassadors advise the DESC in the development of professional development series focused on the instructional shifts that will be happening with the arts framework. And once this PD series is built, the regional ambassador teams will lead 10 hour PD sessions in series for their educators in their region. So she's the ambassador for this region. And I, I'm, I'm extending her um, title, so I'm going to say congratulations to Ambassador Dr. Whittlesey. I figured I had to throw it all in there. Um, and then lastly, this is a little bit of a long one, and we have a video that's going to go along with it. But um, Chelmsford is one, and along with other communities, we participate in Project 351, which uh, one of our eighth grade students each year is chosen as an ambassador, since we're on the theme of ambassadors, to participate in a youth-based positive change movement, and it also provides leadership skills for that student. And this past Wednesday, um, Project 351 convened for their first annual celebration of movement makers, women leading change which is the first celebration that they have for women and young women in Massachusetts who build strong, just, and inclusive communities. Their celebration included um, Isabel Cole, which she was a Project 351 ambassador in 2015 when she was an eighth grader. She just graduated from Chelmsford High School last year, 2019. So she flew up from Washington, D.C., where she's serving full-time with City Year, and to share her story of service to a sold-out room of private sector, uh, for private sector people, civics, and education leaders. And a video was created that highlights three women that were Project 351 ambassadors as eighth graders, at, which includes obviously Isabel, and how that experience is something that that's taking them through their adult years. So we're gonna take a little bit of time to watch, it's about a four minute video, uh, and, and recognize one of our former graduates, um, Isabel Colt. our generation as technology driven and self-obsessed, being reckless and being irresponsible, superficial, ignorant, and I think we're underestimated because of that. There is so much more that teenagers and young people have to offer. Right now our country is in this very vulnerable state. Our communities are kind of wrought with divisiveness and now more than ever it's important to turn to young people. From my experiences I've noticed that young people are much better at having respectful and effective conversations among themselves, even more than the elected officials that we have right now. My name is Nora Saez, I'm Project 351's class of 2013, and I'm a biomedical student at the University of New Hampshire. Project 351 is an organization dedicated to the service learning and leadership development of young people all across the state of Massachusetts. On launch day, eighth graders come together in Boston, listen to impactful and powerful speakers, and then they each are deployed to various service sites around the city, and they return to their communities energized, empowered, and ready to work. My name is Skylar Ripple. I am a class of 2018 ambassador for Project 351, and I represent Nashville. The people at Project 351 are people that want to serve and will wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to do so. And if the country and the world had more people like that, we wouldn't have as many of the problems as we do now. Mantras like choose kindness and serving with others rather than down to them are always in the back of my mind. In a way, I carry Project 351 with me everywhere I go. My name is Isabel Cole. I'm a proud Project 351 ambassador from the class of 2015. I currently serve with City Year in Washington, D.C. At the Achievement Academy in Southeast D.C., my teammates and I have the opportunity to bridge the achievement gap between what students in the school are learning versus what they're supposed to be learning on their grade level. Project 351 showed me different pathways to empowerment, 
receiving adequate and quality medical care is a form of empowerment because not only does it build healthy individuals, but it also makes healthier communities as a whole. In pursuing medicine, I hope to be of service to others. is someone who changes something that they are passionate about. It can be large scale like Martin Luther King or it can be something small within your own community. Project 251 is founded on harnessing the power of young people through service and have been able to appreciate gratitude and compassion and the different values that Project 251 has instilled in me because they're also here in City Year. People that do service are all connected. Project 351 has introduced me to the phrase Ubuntu, which means I am because you are. My humanity is tied to your humanity. Everything that Project 351 does and has been doing for the last 10 years has a ripple effect that is going to change the world. Having people believe in me has pushed me out from the crowd. So instead of being a product of the times, I'm able to be a product of love and compassion. I'm so thankful for the service heroines and the movement makers that I've met and learned about through Project 351. I've learned from them that my voice in every room is valuable and it should be taken into account. So this year, we will obviously have a new eighth grader that will participate in this project, um, 351. And it, you can see it's a huge impact, and it's something that you know we don't take lightly here, obviously, in Chelmsford when choosing our students. And we're just you know super excited to be part of it. And Dr. Lang received this video, which I think they did an excellent job with um, in order to uh, broadcast what this program is about. In fact, we talked about, obviously, we'll share it with our two middle school principals so that they can it would help them in the decision making for students students and for themselves so we just wanted to make sure we had a chance to share it and then that is it for um, good news thank you all right anybody else have anything good news my time I do first of all that was an incredible video yeah they did a great job it was a really we did not nothing we just showed it so well it was yeah. it was just a great video <laughs> and I like the message about that you can do something big or something small mm -hmm. so I did want to recognize uh, coach Martinez and the boys soccer team because they broke down the um, Tomes for friends of the library book sale Oh. on that Sunday when it was finished. And that's a big undertaking, um, loading up all those boxes of books and getting them ready either to be um, stored or picked up by um, a book dealer. So thank you to them. They did a terrific job. Um, the friends had nothing but great things to say about how polite and hardworking they were. All right, anybody else have anything? Okay, great. All right, uh, we're now to our public comment section since now you have an, now have an audience. Uh, would anyone like to speak on any of the agenda items? Okay. All right, moving on then to uh, new business. Thank you. Uh, first item of the agenda this evening is um, just a schedule for you. Um, these will be the upcoming um, list of the different departments and schools over the course of the school year that will be coming to uh, talk about some of the ongoing work in their buildings. Um, we're going to be starting at our next meeting um, on Tuesday, October 15th with our ELL department, our ELL reading in Title I. Uh, Kelly Rogers will be available to uh, give a presentation. And we ask each of the departments and the schools uh, to come forward and talk a little bit about some of the goals for the year, what some of the particular initiatives or projects that they're working on. Um, the kids, uh, the kids, the schools oftentimes get to bring kids with them to uh, show some of the uh, things that they're working on in their schools. Um, so we'll be doing that again this year. We've gotten very good feedback from the public who watches our meetings and um, also from the schools that are really interested in coming forward to talk about uh, some of the projects that they're working on. So I um, just wanted to provide that uh, schedule to you. Uh, from time to time, something could come up over the course of the year where we need to um, move something around. But uh, this gives us a good little outline for, uh, for what's coming. Uh, so just wanted to share that with you. Any questions, Donna? No questions. Um, if we have time, can we get a, um, a, maybe a presentation from the special education department mm -hmm. as well at some point in there? Yes. Um, sure. And then the other one I wanted is social-emotional learning. There's nothing in there. 
Yeah, there's a, there were a couple of coordinators um, who just weren't available at this point to select the date. Um, so the um, coordinator for SEL uh, programming, Lorraine, was not available. So I will be scheduling her in for a time. Okay. We also had, um, I don't know that we'll do a full um, presentation on it, but our nursing coordinator uh, will schedule something over the course of the year on that. Um, so yes, uh, in the end, we'll, we'll get, weave all those departments in. Um, but this is the, um, oftentimes the, the, it's the individual coordinators that kind of do the department level presentations. So uh, but I'll I'm make a note of um, special ed and uh, SEL for you. Would, would guidance fall under the social emotional learning mm -hmm. and they would present as well under that? Yeah, How like is there a specific um, just, focus area? Just wondering, you know, about the whole setup of that department and maybe they could report on how they interlink with social emotional learning, how that works within the school system? Yeah, that would be uh, Lorraine. It would be? Okay. Because the guidance counselors and uh, those supports fall under her. That'd be great. Thank you. And the only other one I could think of is the food services. Um, yeah, there are different times. Like I know uh, food services will be coming forth in um, they annually, in May or June, technology of the same. Um, special ed typically follows up after the CPAC does their presentation. We just didn't know what those dates okay. are yet, so we didn't necessarily populate them on the calendar. But uh, food service usually comes in the spring when we're doing yeah. the bidding for the um, for the uh, products for the coming year. So again, this is just kind of like a high level, at least one presentation per meeting, but there will be some others that get added on. I will say that, uh, I think it was last Thursday, could have been the Thursday before, um, we had a, a great meeting with Amy and the um, special ed coordinators. I heard that one It was yeah. terrific. And uh, what a great team. Um, and really just a wealth of information. Um, and it made me think that, uh, you know, there's special education is uh, very complicated, many layered, and it would be great, I think, for the community to be able to hear about that. Okay. Right. Anything else on that? Okay. Next item. Okay. Um, second, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Hirsch to talk about the MCAS debacle, uh, so she can uh, she can fill you in on that. I've done a lot of talking about this. Um, so you, obviously, I wrote you a memo. We needed to send the memo out for us because we were addressing the student body, and we didn't want you to be caught off guard. But publicly, we just wanted to talk a little bit about um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's option for a retest for the ELA portion of the MCAS for this um, November. Last spring, there was a controversial question that was eventually taken out of the scoring. So students took the test. That question turned into a little bit of an issue for some people. And so the, the commissioner decided at that point that that test question should be removed and not scored for students. However, there were some people that still felt as though they could have been compromised after seeing that question, making them not able to perform to full capacity for the rest of the testing situation of that day. So it wasn't just the question, it was how did I perform past that point? So the remedy that, the, that DESE has come up with is to offer students who felt as though they were compromised an opportunity to take a retake of that ELA test. Now the purpose of this is because there is the John and Abigail Adams scholarship that's provided for students that have at least one um, advanced and at least two proficients in the three different areas for MCAS. And if these students were compromised, perhaps they were compromised to be uh, qualified for the John and Abigail Adams scholarship. So students, if they felt as though they were compromised, uh, they could retake this test. So we received a list of 292 students that could have been compromised um, after taking this test and to inform them that they have the option for this retest in November. Now it's important to note a couple of things that the retest is the legacy test, which is the prior test to the new one. Um, you guys probably are gonna take the, you take the regular one. And it's paper uh, pencil and it's three days. So it has the three sessions. It has ELA session one, session two, and then they have the writing session. So those students will be taking that test and you, what they'll do is they'll take the scoring from that, which is different than the current scoring for our MCAS, and do an equal percentile linking to see if those students have met a higher score than what they have scored on their ELA test for now. I know this gets complicated. This does not change their current score. So for example, if I have a, a 520, let's just say on ELA, 
if I were to get a 260, which is the old scoring guide, it doesn't mean I'm going to get a new score for my current score now. They're not going to bump me up to, and I'm making up numbers, obviously, because I'm not a psychometrician, um, to like a two, two or five. 40 okay so that score that's going out to parents right now which we actually have which will be going out next Wednesday um, are for that's not going to change anything so they're just going to use this for the scholarship purpose only so they come up with some type of configuration math wise to find out who the top 25% students are on those three tests are that will receive that scholarship it has nothing to do with GPA it has nothing to do with class rank because these are, you know, it's not linked. That would be easy. We would have that information. This is top 25% of students taking those three tests. So in other words, you don't have to be in the top 25% of your class to receive the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. And what that scholarship gives you is um, free tuition to any of our state schools. However, please keep in mind that tuition is about eight hundred dollars per semester so a lot of the rest of the tuition is in fees so I just don't want people to think that this is a large monetary money but it's still money and it's helpful for families so it's approximately fifteen hundred dollars so in doing so we put together a letter for the parents prior to the letter going out last Friday we pulled the junior class down to the Performing Arts Center and Principal Murray and I discussed this with the students because sometimes they're best able to, obviously it was about them, they should be part of their own decision making, and to be able to help their parents navigate this letter that was gonna go home, because you can understand how um, complicated this can be. Um, we've also created an FAQ that went out, yes, today's Tuesday, went out yesterday, because there were still some questions beyond what we addressed in there, or you know they needed some more clarification around the information in there and so far I did talk to Principal Murray there are three parents that believe in students that would like to at this time take the retest the reason it's important is we have to order the retest so we are asking that pa that parents and students make this decision by Friday so we can let the department know how many retests we need to be sent to the district so that's kind of the controversy in a, in a nutshell. So again, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education are the ones that have identified the students and only those students received that notice. And we explained that to the, to the 11th graders that if you do not receive this notice, it's because you are not one of the affected students. When would the retest be? So it's, uh, I think it was the 6th, 7th, and 8th. It's three days in November. We have those dates already. So those students would miss three days of class? They would miss three days of class. So we talked about, you know, risk-reward kind of piece on this, but they would, re they would miss the class. They would have the opportunity to make up their work, but we would still continue on with classes at the high school. What, what determined whether or not a student was eligible was on, based on the version of the test that they took? No, so you, like I said, you have to have an advance and then at least two proficients. So oh, they right. might have already had an advanced on one of their other MCAS, the mathematics or the um, science and technology, or they could have had, uh, they still could have had an advanced on this test, but maybe perhaps it was compromised in the fact that they had proficiency. I don't have the, none of us in the Merrimack Valley have any of the mathematical, you know, equations that they're using to do this. Only Desi has that information. And those award letters do not come out until the fall. So this fall, we're receiving the class of 2020's letters to go out to parents. This class that's being affected, which is your juniors, that we'll get that letter in the fall of 20 at this point. All right, any questions? I actually got a question. Yep. Um, so if someone, if one of us like did the controversial question, right, what if they did really well? So does that not count at all? It was not scored. Okay. Yeah, you're the second person that's asked me that. That's interesting. Somebody else felt like they did very well in that question and they wanted it scored, but it is not scored. It's been taken out of your score. Okay. Would that affect, though, if he did really well on that, would that affect his, like, cause it to go down because he really knocked it out of the park? No, because it's taken, we don't, okay, we, we don't know if he knocked it out of the park. No, 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 no offense. <laughs> We're just assuming. We're just assuming. Right. Just assuming. Right. Assume you did. But it I know you did a great job. It, the, yeah. the playing field is leveled because it's been, you know, it's been removed. And I'm sure if you knocked it out of the park with that one, the other ones were incredible. Yeah, hmm. yeah we'll never know. You're never going to know that. Yeah. I know you did great. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on this? So they have to tell it by Friday? Yep. So by Friday. Um, and that's why we, it was important for us to get that out last Friday to give people the weekend and then a few other days. And then we can then order the test next week. And they'll, we'll take it from there. 
and provide an opportunity for those students to retake the test. We're never going to receive those results. Like that's going to DESE. And like I said, it's not going to affect anything we have right now for graduation requirements. They, we have the current scores. Those scores will stay. Has the state stated anything on what they're going to do next time to avoid this problem? Um, not really. I mean, there's oversight committees for these questions. So this was, this is interesting. So I don't know how, how they determine that, but there's supposed to be oversight for this. And I'm not sure how it was either controversial, mm -hmm. not controversial. That's something that they're going to have to work with. They work with educators that actually look at this. So the humanities mm -hmm. people were looking at these questions. Right. All right. Well, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, we knew that that was the little controversy brewing out there, so I figured it would be a good opportunity just to share that information with you and um, see where that goes. Mm -hmm. so, um, next item of the evening, number three. Um, I talked a little bit about this at our last uh, meeting, but we did um, contract with um, Roger Hatch, who is the retired uh, school finance administrator at the Department of Ed. He's currently doing some consulting. He's actually doing some projects for MASS, the Superintendent Association, he obviously is still in the loop on the um, all the different funding uh, scenarios at the state level. Um, to work with us to put together a report specific on Chelmsford finances, um, I think it's actually a good opportunity to just kind of revisit, you know, historically what has happened with um, Chapter 70 funding, all the different available state funding to Chelmsford for specifically over the years, but it, particularly in light of a lot of the uh, pending legislation uh, that's out there that's being bantied about and talked about. Um, with regard to how that might impact Chelmsford in the short term and long term. Um, so I just gave you a little sketch, uh, and I provided this by email. Um, some of the committee members had given me some feedback. I took that feedback and I gave that to, um, to Roger as he's starting to put together his, um, his overview. Uh, but just again, wanted to share that sketch with you. Um, I mentioned it to uh, Town Manager Cohen when I met with him yesterday too. Just if he had any ideas on the town level that he'd like um, Roger to take a look at, he'd certainly be willing to. And then what we're hoping is um, to be able to take a look at some of this um, data. Um, well, I'll probably have some type of a draft towards the end of October, early November, uh, be able to have a report uh, to the school committee in the November, November time frame, actually have Roger come to a meeting. And then we talked about um, he could provide certainly that higher level overview for the school uh, committee, um, any kind of public boards. Um, one of the things we might um, want to talk about, and I did mention to um, Paul yesterday, um, was when we get together as a tri-board, uh, typically in December, when we have the Board of Selectmen, the FinCom, and the school committee all together, maybe having Roger come and actually do kind of a, um, a higher level overview of what's happening just so those groups are all on the same page. But then he's also willing and is going to work with us to put together um, some materials for different uh, audiences. So maybe even just a, um, a simplified you know, one or two page little flyer or handout for just a community member or a parent to um, kind of inform and, and let them know what's happening with uh, finances as we go forward. Again, I think it's good to just kind of set the, um, the history, bring everyone up to speed with what could happen under the different funding scenarios. And then in the years to come, if um, you know we ever have issues where we need to go to the town for financial support on particular matters, um, we'll have we'll already kind of have that um, um, as a background document to be able to share. So um, he has started his work. If uh, individuals have additional information they'd like him to look at, he's certainly open to that. Um, so pass it along. But I did already send your comments in for the ones I've received so far. And um, again, we're looking at that, you know, late, late October, November timeframe for draft um, for us to internally take a look at. And then probably that second meeting in November, have a, a report for you at the uh, school committee meeting. And then I think, again, we'd be in line for a um, discussion with Tri-Board if the committee would like to do that when that happens in December. But I think it's going to be a very worthwhile report. And then I think, again, just even um, to, um, you know, kind of keep that document um, as living as it can be, um, I'll probably add as, a, as an appendix to our budget document this year. Uh, again, just if someone were to ever look back in, in the years to come, um, they'd be able to find that document and that analysis. Mm -hmm. So. Well, thank you for doing that. Cause yeah, I know we always we get the questions. Yeah, we get yes, questions yeah. all the time about you know why don't we get as much as Westford? You know what's going to happen with this new bill, bills, and so hopefully we can answer some right. of those. And there's been different versions even at the state level. Um, the Senate Obviously. had a particular um, act they were pushing. The House had a different one. So um, Roger is really right in in touch with uh, with what's happening, and he's kind of the go-to person for a lot of the state level agencies anyway. So he's he's doing this analysis. He's on the know of what's happening, and and he was. Um, 
um, excited uh, to, to take a look at Chelmsford. And for a so finance person, that's actually, <laughs> that's a big thing when they get excited. <laughs> so I think this is really important for us because, um, you know, and as you said, Dennis, you know, this has been questions that we've been getting from the community for a long time about, you know, state funding. So what I'm, I was curious if, if he could also provide us, I and mean, we took a look at the Promise Act, and we knew that that really wasn't going to benefit us mm -hmm. in any um, large way. If he could give us some ideas about things that, as, that Chelmsford could do, you know, to maybe push for some legislation that would have maybe more of an impact than some of these other things that are currently suggested. Sure. Yeah, that was one of, uh, one of the bullets. I think some you may have even provided it, so I sent that along to him as well. Okay. Um, so he will. He'll look at these the current formulas. Um, you know what's what's pending out there, even um, on a small level. Different things we can try to. Um, you know we've talked about like say school choice, different things like that. Right. Different initiatives that we can try to um, to push. Thank you. Right, anything else? Okay. Great. Thank you for doing that. Yep. No, I think it's going to be very worthwhile. So. Uh, item four this evening, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Hirsch again to um, give us a little overview on some of the professional development um, happenings in the district this coming uh, fall and school year. Yeah. So like, we thought it was important. You hear a lot of the different things I talk about on this PD day. We did this. Teachers were able to do that. I thought it would be great to see an overview because it's not just a very simple process that we do for professional development. We actually provide a lot of different access points for teachers to be able to um, go through professional development. So we've, all, as a committee, we've developed a philosophy and what's important is that there's a variety of options be, and access points for teachers because everybody's at a different point. You have a new teacher that might need something and you have a veteran teacher that might want to expand, expand their knowledge base on um, some type of content or pedagogy. So we just really want to make sure that we have those um, promotion, those PDs pieces for them to enhance their instructional practice. So obviously we have our purpose and it's beyond the fact that we need to provide PD. It's, it's a requirement from the state. Uh, educators have to be licensed and there's not one PD program that's going to be able to get you all your licensing professional development points but as a district we provide a lot of other opportunities beyond the days that we have so basically our professional development sets the standards for knowledge and decision making for schools so when we have initiatives we use that information to then make the changes through our professional development and we try to provide flexibility for our teachers as well as um, making sure that they're, the district is always learning and growing together. So this is just a snapshot. Um, there is a little change because I noticed that on the um, March 3rd, I think I left it as multi-part series on your uh, packet, but I made the change here. So this is just a snapshot of the days that we have where teachers will be having professional development and then also um, to show you basically what kind of the, the focus areas that we're looking at as a district. So we have these embedded PD days and not only for state initiatives but also to provide teachers an opportunity to work with each other and work collaboratively. So of course the big push for this school year is the blended learning and the, the continuation of MTSS and SEL for our, our different levels. But there's also building base initiatives. So if one of the principals is working towards put in, uh, putting something into their building, they would use PD days to be able to access the teachers and work with the teachers to be able to get that new initiative that's building base solely into their, um, into their PD days. So it's, it's a combination of teachers, you also have um, administrators, you have the department coordinators who are also administrators that are all <coughs> providing professional development in the district. So it's not just a one, you know, one um, stop for everybody to do the same thing. There's always something different happening on PD days. Um, one of the things that I find that is very helpful to us is we have a group of collaborative member districts that got together and created the Northeast Professional Educators Network called NPEN. So there was a call for a professional development for teachers. We call them low incident teachers, but what it is is we don't have a lot of them. So you take your L teachers, there's five in the district. Um, your reading teachers, 13 in the district. It's not like your English, your math, your science departments that could have upwards of you know, 58 teachers from grades five through 12. So what was happening for a lot of these these groups that you see here, they were going to PD sessions that may not have been relevant or they really you know, didn't 
didn't we weren't able to put it towards their practice so we got it's pretty expensive to just bring somebody in for those five teachers so we kind of had like you know that moment of well if you have five teachers and I have five teachers when we put our teachers together and then wow they have five teachers and before you know it you have 60 teachers in a content area that most districts only have five of so we created this for the full day professional day for these teachers to get together have quality PD in their content areas. So what ends up happening, so we have, right now we have 30 member <coughs> districts. We started off, I think, with maybe 12. Um, first it started with like a couple of us that said, hey, let's put our, our monies together, and then went to 12. Now we have 30 districts. We actually um, provide this day for 2,100 educators at four, uh, six different sites. Chelmsford's one of the sites. So each one of our sites holds one of these departments or multiple departments, like we have a lot of rooms, so I take a lot of them. And they get to come for professional development in their content area. And what's nice about it is that we, um, so each district has to pay into it, so it depends on how many teachers you're having um, attend. So we have about 150 teachers leave. I pay $1,400 do the math it's about nine dollars a teacher you're never going to receive professional development for nine dollars a teacher in any department um, sometimes de professional development is thousands of dollars so we have um, coordinators not our just our coordinators but coordinators working in these departments they come up with the PD sessions they put the whole thing together we serve lunch it's it's like manage chaos in the buildings and we provide this um, this educator network for these teachers. The other thing with NPEN is that as a district, if we have room in some of our other PD that's district based, I offer it up to these member districts. Hey, I have five seats available, I have two seats. So that district doesn't have to pay their $1,400 is not just for this day. Those teachers can come to Chelmsford and take a course at Chelmsford for the open seats, just like Chelmsford teachers could go to their districts for the open seats. So it's a little bit, I probably less than $9 a teacher. And then um, last year we started with EdCamp, and EdCamp is kind of like a grassroots professional development. So what they do is teachers all get together. You talk about manage chaos. So groups of educators get together, and what they do is they basically up on a board put up all the ideas that they want, and you get to decide what you go to, and then someone facilitates it. So it's almost like PD on demand. And they call it voice and choice because you get to vote with your feet. If I walk into the session and it's not really fulfilling what I needed and I saw that there was two other sessions, I can get up from that session and go in and find what I need. So they rotate through this process, you know, three times in a full day if, we're, if we have it on the full day. So it's really nice because there's no experts, there's no, it's just sharing your experience and teaching teachers what they know so that they can apply it in their classroom and end up with something that they can show for it. So. Last year we did it, and we were at the Parker Middle School. We're doing it again. I think we have about 50 teachers coming from um, Bill Ricker this year, which will add to it. So this is for, as those other teachers are at NPEN, we'll be at one of the other sites with the leftover teachers of the English, Math, Science, Social Studies. They'll all be working on EdCamp, so they get their own PD that they need based on what they're doing in their content areas. So it's, like, I get, it's actually fun to watch. You have to watch it. It's a little crazy, but it's fun. Um, Chelmsford Public School also offers through Title IIA, I'm able to pay educators, administrators to run three credit graduate level classes or teachers can take them for PDPs only. So what that allows us to do is pay the instructors and then for the educator the cost is only the difference to Fitchburg State of about $315 right now. So they can get three graduate level class uh, credits for about $315 and we base it on some of our initiatives that we're doing. So this year we're running these three classes that you see up here. Um, I actually have room for a fourth class. So our blended learning and personalized learning actually ran twice, two semesters. They're uh, vetted out by the university. They're university instructors, even though they work for us. They um, have a syllabus, it has to be approved. So these are like, you know, robust classes. This is not like a PDP thing. You have a question? Yeah, I have a quick question. I was running I mean, I know the difference, but the difference between uh, PDP and uh, a graduate credit. Yep. So PDPs are for licensure. You need to have them. Graduate level cl classes are for an advanced degree, perhaps, or if you're going for a different certification. And that's a, it's on a transcript. It's a college credit, and or three, which we have. But it's funny because three graduate level credits 
equal to 67 and a half PDPs. So they do still go towards licensure. It's just some people don't want to pay the additional monies. They already have advanced degrees. That's not their purpose of taking the course. I will say that most people that take these courses are taking it for the graduate level classes because it's either giving them another degree in a lane change, which would help them financially as well. And then the one other thing I was wondering if you could mention too is about um, you can take these uh, professional development courses, but in order you have to bundle them in order for them to count towards your licensure. Right. So the way it works is um, you do you have to have bundles of ten to be counting towards a certain subject. Now it doesn't have to be bundles all together. So if I took five PDPs um, in let's say the fall, I happen to take another course on the same topic and I get another five and then so on and so forth, I bundle them together for my recertification. But you have to have a minimum of 10. You have to have a minimum of 10 under the content areas that are required for recertification. And I'll talk a little bit about that okay. because we do have a few courses that we make it specific for the recertification process. Can I ask a question? Is this all paid by under the contract or how does this work in terms of the payment? No, actually um, it's paid from Title IIA. So okay. anybody can sign up for it. We provide it to all the teachers, so any teacher can sign up and take the So course. there's no limitation? There's no limitation, mm -hmm. except we usually stop a class at 20, but we haven't okay. been hitting 20. And if we had to go to 21, we'll go to 21. We're, we're pretty flexible. And then obviously we have workshops and training for any of our new curriculum adoption or any of our online pieces. This is just a snapshot of a few of our things that teachers have to um, definitely receive some type of workshop and training on um, in order to implement in their classrooms. So again, here's another option for professional development within the district. And another way to get professional development points, and if you really want to focus in on a topic, is to really do a book group. And what teachers do is they make, I have a whole proposal process. They work with their department coordinator, they work with their principal. So if there's something that they really want to focus on, they'll find some, an expert in the area, find their book, work together. They give me the proposal to make sure that they've met all the requirements for a book group. And if everybody's you know happy with that, we sign off on it and we let them follow through with a book group so they can get additional PDPs. And this is just, again, a snapshot of some of them that are going to be running. Some of these are run by teachers, some of them are run by administrators, and some of them are run by our coaches. So getting to what you were talking about, Donna, so part of, um, part of the certification process with the new regulations is that teachers have to have at least 15 PDPs and the sheltered English immersion, SEI, and they have to have within their um, certification cycle, which is usually about five years and they have to have 15 PDPs in special education. So in a way to be able to have teachers have that option and not be looking for courses, because we're, we're actually approved by DESE as PDP providers, so we, we're already vetted out as a district. We had um, two of our faculty members create these 15 PDP modules for them to take those two classes. They are five weeks asynchronous. They sign up like they would for the graduate level course. The instructor gets in, in touch with them. I pay the educator to create the course and to monitor the course. And then also with the blended learning, we wanted to make sure that teachers had, a, if they couldn't take the time to take the blended learning graduate class or they didn't need to really take a graduate class, we provided upwards of, um, I believe at this point they can get up to 20 because they're creating more and more modules. Our um, TIS, our technology integration specialist, put together a section of the graduate class so that teachers could still do blended learning and apply it towards their recertification as well. So they worked really hard on that. Maria, with the um, um, sheltered uh, English immersion um, retail yep. um, classes, uh, it was to, in order to be able to help all teachers be able to more effectively deliver instruction to English language learners. So now it's required as part of our licensure that we have to do so many hours yes. in every five year cycle. Yeah, after yeah. you've taken that course, if you, were if you were an educator that needed yeah. to take that course. And it looks like it's part of your low incident. I looked at that, yep. English language learners. That's yep. good. And then uh, the mentor training program. So for teachers to become a mentor, and I'll talk a little bit about mentoring moving forward, they would go through this um, process for 15 PDPs, or they get 10 PDPs, I'm sorry, for the course in order to be trained as a mentor. So contractually, getting back to what you're talking about, we have outside course reimbursement. So we're, we're required to provide course reimbursement for our teachers contractually. 
and it's a tiered system, which is nice because it's not like it used to be for his come for a serve. And maybe <laughs> Jeff and, and Sharon can understand. I mean, there was a lot of elbowing going on here at Central Office. You had to get in here and get stamped, and otherwise you weren't getting course reimbursement. I don't know, a couple of fights broke. No, I'm like kidding. Um, but yeah, it was a lot. So what we did is to try and make that a little bit more fair is a tiered system. So, you know, there's different levels. So if you're working towards certification or graduate class, you're in a graduate program, you get first um, consideration. If you are already taken a course got course reimbursement that's taken into consideration because we want to give it to someone who's never taken a course before so we go through this tiered um, system to make sure that pe teachers tend to receive enough of these graduate level classes I have to be honest with you in the past two years we really haven't had anybody that we have said no to um, a lot of people want to take them in the summer fall seems to be a big one because I think it's a, it seems like a shortened semester but it really isn't everything's about 16 weeks um, you've got all your energy yeah, that, you're ready, you're excited. And then, um, but we've never found it that too many people were ever rejected. If not, we keep them on the wait list. So sometimes people sign up, they receive the course reimbursement, and then they say, oh, I'm not gonna take the course. And then we go, okay, we'll go to the next person. So it's not as if it, we take the money and spread it out for the four quarters, because there's summer one, summer two, fall and spring. So it's four times we, we break it up for them. So it's not like somebody takes all the money up front. <coughs> Like, like we used to. <laughs> um, what's really nice is that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has created now the Center for Instructional Support. What they're doing is they're putting together PDP sessions for teachers in these content areas that I have listed here, that, that some of them are hybrid, some of them are face-to-face, -face, some of them are completely online. So it all depends on the course and what's being offered. So teachers can actually go to this link and be able to take professional development through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. If it happens to coincide during their teaching time and it's something that we, you know, would like to send them to, we can always send them, you know, during the during the day to meet up with these for these um, sessions. So they're they're actually doing a really, really nice job of allowing that to be available for teachers because they never really had that many things for us in the past. And then, so I'm going to go in a little bit about mentoring, coaching, and our TIS, our Technology Integration Specialist, because these are three other ways that teachers are receiving PD. And this is more like embedded PD, what's happening during the day, so it's not on those days, it's not before school, after school, it's, so we'll start with mentoring. So as I said before, teachers have to be trained mentors. They work with the mentor coordinator for the district. Right now it's Mary Beth McAllister, so she's been working with the teachers. They meet uh, four times a year, but there's also 50 hours of mentoring that's provided from the mentor to the mentee or the protege. So they get to uh, observe their classrooms, their lessons, they meet with them, they brainstorm with them, um, come up with different workshops, maybe talk to administrators if they believe you need to go to something. So mentor training is that embedded job um, professional development that our new teachers and teachers that ha are new to the profession or new to their content area are receiving. I think Fitchburg is offering mentoring class, uh, classes and becoming a mentor. And now they split it into uh, gen ed and special ed. Oh, okay. So there's just, so if you're going to become a, um, a mentor for um, you know, a special ed teacher, for example, you would take this course and it would teach you just a little bit more about the whole process. Separated it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, good. Melissa McMahon was the mentor coordinator pro beforehand, and she did a really nice job coming up with handbooks that were specific to that. So like, it's a little different for school counselors. Right. So there's a handbook, and they address that piece. There was the one on, I know, special ed. So she kind of expanded this program. She just couldn't be the mentor coordinator this year. So she took the time to really address those low-incident groups too, right, um, that may have just got the blank get mentoring but what does it look like for those um, those different content areas so we and I didn't know if Mary Beth was teaching it through Fitchburg and then that way if we offered it through them they could get credits no we didn't you know we, we just do still doing our in-house one because we took uh, maybe six years ago Salem State came in to help with mentoring when the state was really pushing the mentoring program we actually brought in Salem State to train all of our people on how to actually have a mentoring program in-house that's a little bit more sustainable. So right now in our system, do we have several people serving as mentors or oh, we have a, how do we track this? So we have, a, we have a form, so the principals work with um, the department coordinators to decide who's going, they have the list of who's a trained mentor and based on what the job is, they work with those teachers to make sure that they couple them together. So if it is a special ed position, 
they would be looking for a special ed mentor. If it is a nursing position, nursing. And if it's math, it's math. So sometimes a mentor can actually be in a different building. So say, for example, um, there's not enough people. Like, I'll take nursing because there's only typically one nurse, maybe two nurses in a building. Sometimes we might have, the nurse might have more than one mentee and they might be in a different building, but we would release them to be able to go and, and work with that, okay. that teacher. So everybody's coupled with somebody who's in their content area. We've had op, um, different situations too where we've had two mentors for one person. They, you know, they'll split the stipend, but maybe that person needs a little bit of support in the content area, but also the other pieces of that. Like for example, um, our team, we actually have mentors for our administrators too, but our team chairs, they might need a little bit of support with the special ed and how that goes, but then how, do, how does the other inner workings go? So I have a team, team chair and a department coordinator as that person's mentor. They just split the position. This was um, one of the things that they were doing to help retain teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's been a very important program that we have here in Chelmsworth, well, actually everywhere. Yeah. Because they felt alone. If you didn't have that go-to person, they didn't know what to do. So right. anybody I'm just that asking you that because in my profession, yeah. we actually get interviewed. There are so many of us who don't mind being mentors that the so candidate many. will interview us to see if we're a good match. So I just don't know if... You know, if in this, if we have sufficient number of mentors that, you know, a person can choose, right? Because right. matching the personality and so on is also oh, important. absolutely. I mean, we make sure that's that's kind of the workings of the building principal to say, all right, this would be a better match for this person. This person's going to need somebody that has this skill set. Okay. And then they talk to that, that you don't have to be a mentor, like it's, it's not handcuffed to say right. you have to be a mentor. Yeah. So they, they have the opportunity to say this isn't going to be a good match for me, and they go to someone else. Okay. Um, we also have coaches, again, through Title IIA, I'm pretty fortunate um, that we receive enough monies to be able to bring in our coaches, although um, Title I helps us out as well. So we coming soon, we're going to have an elementary um, writing coach. And when I say elementary, it's more of a, a middle school position because it's fifth and sixth grade. We're trying to target two grade levels, um, especially in that transition year. So we have math coaches in the district for elementary and middle school. And, you know, really, they're not evaluative. They're here to help you. They provide you with professional development. They go into your classroom, model lessons, help you understand uh, the new standards, anything that's happening. So they're, they're just, an, it's almost like mentoring, but it's coaching, and it's for those content areas, and they're invaluable. I mean, we don't, <laughs> I don't think we pay them enough for what they do, but we're very fortunate to have who we have for coaches in this district, and teachers can call upon them to come in and help them out with anything. They also run, like I said, book groups. Um, and that's just for the fact that they just really are passionate about what they do. And then, not to forget our technology integration specialists. So they have a lot of staff-driven or weekly topics based on what they're seeing in the district. So I'll give a, a simple example of when we went with TeachPoint, and even as we continue with that, is teachers are like, I don't know how to navigate putting in my evidence. How do I do this? What would be best? They'll run a whole session on how to upload your evidence or how to you know, share your information. Uh, they'll, uh, if teachers are needing some help with, um, I've seen people that said I need to have students really work on a spreadsheet, but I don't know how to put the graphs in. How does that work? They'll run a weekly topic or go into the classroom or see the teacher one-on-one. -on -one. So our integration specialists are, are key, and they're also providing one of the graduate level classes. They've combined it together, so um, they're all doing a section of that graduate level class to show their expertise through that. So they're, they're a great resource in the district. And um, for our students and our teachers, so obviously with the one part of the one-to-one -one initiative includes Google Classroom. So this is a platform, if you think about it, a way for our students to interact with each other, with their teachers, where all the assignments would be, announcements. Um, what what's important about this is that when students leave us, when they go into either college or career, they're going to interface with some type of platform to either do a training or submit work when they're in college. So Google Classroom allows teachers to learn what does this look like for students, how can they work both face-to-face, -face, virtually, hybrid, and they use Google Classroom to do this. And we would be doing our students an injustice if we didn't give them an online platform because I will tell you, all colleges, you're gonna use Blackboard. 
either even if your class is face to face that's where your grading is that's how you interface with your peers that's how you submit your assignments so having Google Classroom is similar to the Blackboard assignments it's just getting used to a different platform and um, also allowing students to access curriculum when they I mean how many people here I mean I know at least for myself you can't find the assignment it's smushed somewhere at the bottom of the backpack you can pull it up on your Google Classroom somebody can at least access what it was that you were supposed to do so again we're providing training for that and there's different um, apps within the classroom that you can add on and put into your classroom and be able to you know add videos or put in some type of a discussion board any of those features <coughs> and lastly um, this all comes to you it's like a service announcement from the professional development committee so we have a professional development committee that's a combination of teachers and administrators that we do our best to have we have all levels represented and we want to make sure that we have as many content areas represented and it's we have a co-chair which is one of our teachers that co-chairs it alongside me so that we have some you know governance on both sides they have somebody they can go to if they feel like they're not being heard and um, that is basically the end of my presentation so I'm open for any questions so how do people become members of this committee I usually put an all call out saying if you'd like to be part of it come on in so um, not everybody has time to be part of it so we don't want it to be too big you don't want it to be too top heavy with a level like you don't need all elementary school teachers and nobody from the high school uh, if we find that a level or content area isn't represented nobody volunteers we kind of you know go and do a little you know hi how you doing you look like you'd be great for the PD committee so I put it out there teachers can then volunteer I've never been in a situation where someone's turned away from the PD committee but if we did find that we needed other levels or other areas serviced we kind of go and do a little um, PR around it the teachers are pretty good because it affects them they want to be part of it so we have other staff groups um, in the district that um, also participate in professional development our paraprofessionals our food service um, what is the process for them what are like who plans their professional development who oversees it what is is it specifically geared towards um, their position or things that they need to know yeah so a couple of things I mean food service maybe Joanna would have a little bit more information I'm assuming that Nancy Antolini provides the professional development I'm sure it's state driven certain you know requirements that they have for the paraprofessionals when it's a building day per se like so SEL is they're part of that building day because SEL is for everyone um, our paraprofessionals on that end pen day we do provide PD for paraprofessionals out in Lawrence but um, our paraprofessionals are not required to come on that day if they wanted to come we would be more than happy to do that the rest of their additional days their content days are provided through special ed so they do their professional development that way because they're job specific or group specific so they don't they don't usually sit on this committee to make those decisions but they are welcome to take other professional opportunities because some of them are licensed you know mm -hmm. so they want to keep their licensure up um, but they are part of their building based ones I can tell you that right now so yes. we have what is it, October 10th it's an SEL day so I know that everybody's planned for that right. yeah. the next one as Linda said the next one coming up they're all gonna be building based because it's the SEL day but I did um, I have a conversation with Amy uh, Reese and I mentioned also to Kathy the para uh, person I asked them just to get together and actually talk about um, you know filling in those content days for the year figuring out how um, they could best provide some PD specifically for different populations of the Paris um, so when that's finalized um, we can certainly provide you with that report as well it won't be quite as um, lengthy sure. as this one but um, we can provide that at, uh, at an upcoming meeting and it is Nancy that um, uh, takes care of the professional development for the food service staff a lot of that's more um, specific training that's required for them around uh, meeting different health provisions and things along those lines but um, Nancy actually plans that within the confines of their contract I know that the um, AFT provides some free workshops for Paris and things like mm -hmm. that if you were looking for you know no cost yep. types of um, you know options right. that may be very specific to uh, what it is uh, that they may be interested in um, yeah. that may be a, an avenue right. to pursue and this yeah, last no. PD day that we had um, one of the, we had this conversation because um, they needed to be introduced to the blended learning piece too so they they started off with those 12 modules that TIS is offering because they need to understand what that is because then the students in front of them 
are using that so they have started off with those modules and most likely we'll do one more day with them if not three it just depends on how quickly they go through the, the different modules and TIS has been monitoring that so I know that they do have that blended learning piece for at least two if not three of the sessions that are coming up thank you okay any other questions on professional development After I retired was when you started the M Pen. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I know. <laughs> I mean, but I don't want to come back. I was to thinking work. of it. But no, um, but I, all of my friends who were still working in the district who are, you know, basically people who fall into that category had, couldn't be more high in their praise. Oh, they're thrilled on that workshops. day. Like, I've never seen a lot of happy, like, you know, really yeah, happy really PD Day right. people. I'm like, yeah. wow. I mean, I've been fortunate enough. I, we, we've been the site for World Languages. Um, related services and music and fine and performing arts. It's been amazing. Of course, now they've decided they want to go to the new um, Bill Ricca High School fine and performing arts. I'm like, that's fine. If I had feelings, they'd be hurt. Um, <laughs> but ha the excitement that's in the building is interesting because I even had one of the English teachers come down the first year we did. They're like, why don't we do this for us? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of you. So hence, Ed Camp coming into play was huge because they will connect with other English, math, science, and social studies teachers. Yep, thank you. All right, moving on to strategic planning meeting for yep, us. I'm, I just took over. Ah. I kicked you right off. Ah. <laughs> Rough crowd here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the uh, next item on the agenda is number uh, five. So this is kind of gearing up for our public forum that we're going to have, the first one, which is scheduled for Tuesday, October 22nd. Um, to start to talk about the um, strategic planning process. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview and talk you through, I thought, what we might be able to cover uh, that evening. And a lot of this we've been doing in sections with different um, admin groups in the district so far, um, but just kind of want to walk you through that. So I think what we should do with the um, uh, crowd when they come is talk a little bit about, you know, what is a strategic plan, um, cover the design process itself, and one of the key uh, factors is going to be to really just try to gather and collect as much information that we possibly can on people's uh, feel, um, feel for the public schools. Um, I kind of term that stakeholder engagement. But we're going to be doing that through the community forums that we're going to be hosting, um, focus groups that uh, we're going to be holding at the school level so that we can get input from uh, staff and personnel within the district, uh, potentially students, also probably the middle school and the high school level, probably not as much at the elementary but I'm um, trying to get some student voice into this as well. And then surveys. And uh, one of the, actually the, one of the first surveys we did um, just yesterday, we had sent out the uh, parent uh, satisfaction survey to start to get some information. And uh, at last look, we had just hit 300 responses so far. So that's not bad that's in good. just a day. <clears throat> you know, I think most people won't possibly look at that until the weekend. So, uh, so that was good, but we'll be able to take a look at that. Um, you know, define some focus areas for our goals. We want to reaffirm our mission and uh, belief statements um, as a district. Identify some strategies that are going to help us be successful in the years to come, and then obviously go through a um, finalization and an adoption plan um, with the school committee, ultimately to, to agree on some type of a three to five year plan. Again, we want it to be as inclusive as possible. Um, school committee I really see as a focal point in this bringing the community together to have that conversation all district staff regardless of what level you're at um, parents students and obviously community uh, members in one of the activities that we had done with our admin group when we met uh, about a week or so ago um, was to and again I think this would be um, a, a nice exercise to go through with that first meeting on the 22nd um, but to, to start with a review of our prior plan that's ending this June so take a look at that three-year plan um, what worked really well? You know, what should what p uh, pieces of that plan should continue? Um, what work you know needs to be refocused? Are there areas that we need to either reshuffle, prioritize, put on the back burner for a year, two, three, or four rollout? Um, and then talk about some new initiatives um, that should come into line and should be the focus of our work. Um, and I think if we um, do that, we'll put a little exercise together to be able to um, take a look at again the initiatives over the last three years. Um, what type of outcomes we've had from those, uh, be able to kind of weave in some of the feedback we've received because it's three weeks from now from that parent survey, um, and to be able to have some kind of tabletop exercises that night. Um, I'll work with Dennis a little bit to kind of figure out what the uh, setup of the session might be, 
but I actually envision um, a bunch of different tables potentially having different topics um, that individuals are asked to go to. And um, we, or facilitators, may rotate around to those different tables and actually try to lead some of the discussion, talk about the different initiatives. Um, again, we're going to hope to have some staff there as well to help facilitate some of this talk. Um, but we will, we will lay that all out for you. And uh, I think if we can walk away after that first night with, um, again, having everyone understand that we're coming to the end of the three-year plan, what's worked well, what do we want to continue, what do we want to not continue, and then if we want to talk about some new initiatives, we should start to have a little bit of conversation on some of the parent feedback we're receiving. When we get together the second time in December, we will have had the staff feedback by that point. We'll have student feedback and student voice in the process and then be able to really talk about how to move forward uh, come December. So I just wanted to kind of uh, put together a couple highlights for you as to uh, how I think that first workshop could go and uh, share that with you this evening. Questions? How long will the parent survey be open for? Oh, we can leave it open for as long as we want to. Okay. Um, I actually thought about uh, perhaps next weekend, um, like Saturday morning or something, just kind of resending my email with a copy of the link to it. Um, we're obviously asking people to just take it once, but we don't have a um, limit on how many times people can take it because you might want to record different data for different schools. Mm -hmm. So technically it's an open survey. So we'll keep it open for a few weeks. We can close it whenever we um, decide to. So we should really probably be bringing that up in our PTO meetings and whatnot to remind yeah. people. Yeah, well, yeah. I, um, we're emailing that out to the, um, to the schools to all include in their weekly broadcast home to parents and the newsletters and whatnot. So I really would like to, over the next two weeks, be able to kind of push that. I don't know when the deck, like the PTO cycle is, but um, we're going to ask the schools to really push that home this week so that, you know, two weeks from now we can set kind of calling that data and taking a look at the feedback we're receiving to get ready for the meeting on the 22nd. But we technically can leave it open as long as we want to. We just have to go back and refresh data as we go. On the student piece of this, are you doing, um, is that face-to-face? -face? Are you doing surveys with them or what's the plan for that? To be determined. Um, okay. So we're going to have one more meeting with the, um, the admin group for us to figure out how to get that um, data. And it might be different at different levels as well. Okay. Um, we certainly could have some opportunity for some um, for a student survey, but I think we might actually offer it up to, uh, particularly at the secondary level, um, some small, you know, either activity through a club or a focus group in the school to just get um, to get some feedback. So I think this is kind of running concurrently with the master plan for the town. Did we ever end up reaching out to? Uh, I did not yet. No. I guess Mr. Zaru is the chairperson for that. Okay. I think. Don't. I could be wrong. But. And that's the town master plan. Yes. You don't know anything about the town master plan, do you? The t uh, master plan for the town? You put her right on the spot there. Yeah, that was, Sorry. That was, that was uncomfortable Sorry. at all. <laughs> She's always prepared. <laughs> What's your question? I didn't know if you had any information on the uh, timeline for the master plan for the town. I don't know the exact timeline. I know that the it's the, it's the master plan update committee. Okay. So they're taking the 2010 master plan um, they're going through it section by section and looking at what needs to be updated, changed. And I know at some point they're planning to invite different committees and groups in from across the town. Um, but this is the this is the master plan that's underneath the planning board. So while they look at some of the bigger things, much of it's about land use. Thank you. See, it tells you she's prepared. That's perfect. <laughs> I, I'll reach out and just let them know that whenever they feel it's appropriate for us to come in, um, to at least find out what's happening or um, get a sense for that, we'd be. I didn't know if there was to. any um, overlap at all. I don't know, but I will call them. Right. Um, how are we advertising for this forum? So we've been just pushing out social media wise. So the flyer that Linda had created is on our website. Um, we're going to ask again the schools to start pushing that in their weekly um, communications home to parents. Um, you know, uh, Facebook, being able to kind of spread that around Facebook wise. Um, we can send a connect that email home to um, to parents too. I'm just trying to think of out, out, outside, outside, of, yeah, outside schools, of the yeah. parents, and you know they're not going to get the connect eds. And um, I'm, I'm open to your ideas. Make an announcement for us. What's that? I said I bet the selectmen would make an announcement for us. They're really good about that. Yeah. No, really, actually, you know, that's a different group of people. You know what I can do too? I, I will call um, the new reporter at the Sun okay. and see if he might be able yeah. to do a little um, little post for us. We also have town meeting coming up. Mm -hmm. yep. Maybe have some flyers there. Yeah, but it's, at it's after. after. Town meeting is after. Yeah, but we have another one in December. Oh, well, true. Yeah, we yeah. can talk about the December one. Right. Okay. 
The ELL group has um, their own open house coming up. Um, I'm wondering if, is there any way to translate the survey into the most prominent second language, which is Spanish? Mm -hmm. And I believe it's still Spanish this year, and make it available at that session? True, that wouldn't be hard. Yeah, it's, That'd it's, be great, it's a I pretty think. basic uh, survey, so we could do that. Um, the other thing is on students. Um, so is there a plan to just do groups on students or what's, I didn't get, catch That's that. what we're working on. So I have one more meeting with the admin group to try to, with building admin and district admin, to try to figure out how best to do that. Um, so I'll be able to report back to you probably the okay. next time we meet um, how we're going to get that data. Um, we're open to maybe some type of a survey tool, but also we're just thinking, particularly at the secondary level, um, advertising to the students but maybe even trying to go through some of the clubs and activities that are already taking place at the school mm -hmm. to um, to get some focus groups of students together well for example at the high school and maybe they can talk more towards this issue but they have elected uh, folks who are in student council who are uh, you know class representatives sure. who maybe can be approached to also reach out to their sure. fellow students um, I believe at the, both middle schools have student councils okay. who are an activity okay. uh, that meet regularly. They, they have, you know at McCarthy, it's 20 to 30 students who participate in that group. Okay, and they might even be able to help us put together some type of a um, little survey instrument to um, cast a wider net for the whole school. That'd be great. Yeah, well, we'll do that. I, we have a meeting, I think it's on Thursday, and we'll try to refine that at that point, and I'll let you know what the outcome was. Okay, thank we you. have another meeting before the public we still meeting. Have an, we yeah. still have another meeting before the public yeah. meeting. Yeah. So we're meeting on the 16th? We have one more meeting. 16th. 16th. Uh, 15th. 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 Yeah, 15th. 15th. So, okay. All right, anything else on that? Okay. All right, next up okay, is capital okay. planning. Yep, let me just shut this off. So back to capital uh, planning, yeah, that's number six on the agenda this evening. I wanted to give you a couple of documents because we are going to be entering the, um, we're going to be entering the capital uh, planning phase of our work gearing up for next year's uh, budget process. So um, you just have a very brief comma memo and then you have a couple of supporting documents. And I would just ask if between now and the next meeting on the 15th, if you could, I'll kind of walk you through what's in these documents. If you could kind of take a look at them, peruse them a little bit, um, familiarize yourself or refamiliarize yourself with them. But um, every year we have a capital planning process in town. There's a capital planning committee. Um, uh, Jeff, I think you're actually the appointee for the school department. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the meetings were moved. It used to be uh, early on a Thursday or Friday, Friday morning. morning. Now they're going to be Thursday evenings. So um, they're going to start in November and uh, conclude probably by early December when they make a recommendation. And typically, um, the town allocates approximately $3 million a year towards capital projects from all town departments. So all town departments between now and the end of October will be submitting their requests. We went through a process, um, and a lengthy process, uh, last year to put together a 10-year capital plan for the schools. And a lot of this stemmed from the Doran Whittier study when they came in and did a facility assessment of our buildings. Um, the town's capital committee uh, basically does a five-year outlook, so we do have a 10-year plan, uh, but we really do focus on the first five years. And knowing that year to year our priorities may shift a little bit, and that's what we need to go through at this point. So last year, um, the second page of the memo that I had given you um, is our actual plan that had gotten submitted to, um, to the town. And you can see in fiscal 20, uh, we had a number of different projects that started at the Biome School that went um, you know, two or three pages um, onto this particular plan. And of that, uh, I think in the cover memo, I mentioned that to you, of that $1.7 million, if you added up that column, we um, had a million uh, 32 that were actually recommended for funding by the Capital Committee and then ultimately went forward at Springtown meeting uh, for approval. So we did have, if you scan through that um, uh, document, because again, you have all the, the backup information for years two, three, four, and five, um, we had lumped the projects into some pretty uh, sig significant buckets, if you want to think of it that way. Um, of the projects we had eight that ultimately comprised that $1.7 million, 
in four of our eight projects were recommended. So I'm on the second memo, which starts on January 4th. Some of the projects are in blue and some are in red. So the blue projects went forward, and that was uh, 452000 for the school security upgrade. That was year one of a three-year uh, upgrade to our school uh, security camera system. We had $285,000 go for a school kitchen uh, code compliance upgrade. So that was a look at several of our schools and several um, kitchen facilities that, that weren't meeting code any longer. We wanted to uh, remedy that. Um, we needed approximately 200000 extra to be able to um, do the parking lot expansion at Harrington Elementary School. And uh, we actually were looking to try to do an, um, some additional parking at Harrington and then also center. So when we had a little bit of money left over from the modular uh, construction project, we were originally trying to earmark that towards both parking lots. Two years ago when we went out to bid, we came up about $200,000 short. So we then had to kind of back off, go to capital to try to get the extra $200,000. We were able to do that last spring. And then this past summer, we got both of those parking lots done. So Harrington, Ian Center. And I have to tell you, we've been getting rave reviews. People are very happy with, uh, with both parking lots. Um, and then the last hundred thousand dollars was were for some uh, just school kitchen upgrades, not code compliant, but just upgrades to the buildings. So there were four projects that actually are still listed in year one, our fiscal twenty, that did not get uh, funded. Uh, one was about a forty thousand dollar improvement for some clocks at uh, I believe it was Center School. One hundred fifty thousand dollars for some duct work repairs at I believe Harrington and I want to say buy them off the top of my head, but I can confirm that tomorrow for you. A uh, big number, about a half a million dollars to do the front parking lot at the high school. So um, two years ago, we had done uh, the rear parking lot at the high school, all the way from the um, entrance of near the Harrington side lot there, all the way down to the back beyond the pack, and it kind of stops before you go up that access road near the track. So we got all the back parking lot done. Uh, DPW actually added lighting, uh, which really looks good. Um, it's all lined and every everything now, so people are happy. It was a two-phase project, so we got the back done in one year, and we were trying to come back in year two and do the front parking lot. So basically, the front where the new sign is, all the way down and out um, the other road. I forget the name of the what road would that go on Richardson. to with Harry Richardson. Richardson. Richardson road. Um, so that did not get funded just because we were exceeding the uh, the whole town cap that year. And then lastly, there was a um, thirty-two thousand dollar project for some some odds and end kind of floor upgrades. So as we um, look at next year, typically we need to put these four projects that are in red back into the list and figure out how they're going to pan out. But what I will say is um, the town manager in his recommendation to the, I believe the Board of Selectmen and then also the FinCom and for the town meeting warrant in the fall, um, with some of the excess cash that the, the town had at fiscal year end, he recommended a number of projects be done outside of the capital uh, planning. So one of the earmarks he does have that's going to town meeting at, in October is $500,000 for the parking lot at the high school. So if that actually gets approved at town meeting this fall, then that drops off our list, and that's a big number that we wouldn't have to try to rework back in for the fiscal 21 budget. So we're going to be watching that and communicating with, um, with the town manager's office on, on that particular number. But what I'd like you to do, if, if you would, between now and the next session, is take a look at those four projects, obviously. Um, let's assume that the high school, that parking lot doesn't go through for argument's sake, and we need to put it in there somewhere. Um, take a look at your fiscal 21 projects, and maybe even look a couple years out. Look at the, the four-year outlook, and see if you still feel that those are prioritized accurately. Um, internally, just so that you know, uh, myself, Brian Curley, our Director of Facilities, um, Gary Persichetti, Paul Cohen will meet either later this week or early next week and kind of talk town-wide what's going on if we recommend any adjustments to that prioritized order. And I'll then produce a report for you for the next meeting when we'll get it together on the 15th. And I'd like to be able to have a talk that night. Again, we don't have to have it tonight, but I just wanted to give you this information. Have a discussion that night about, um, you know, the, the projects that we want to try to bring forward for fiscal uh, 21. Um, and again, uh, I think we had kind of broken this out. Uh, if you look at the spreadsheet that actually has dollar amounts along the bottom, our ask is anywhere between a million and a half and two million dollars a year in capital projects. Um, we know that the town, again, if they're funding about 300, uh, 300 million, 
uh, $3 million, um, you know, that's a pretty significant chunk of those projects. And usually it ends up being about half and half. It's about half town projects and half school projects. But um, we've worked closely with the town in the past. If they have a particular need that really needs to rise to the top, we'll obviously work with them. If we had something, they would work with us in a particular year. Um, so that conversation has been pretty uh, good and free-flowing. Again, we'll have that internal talk later this week, early next week, and then I'll produce um, any you know updates I might have for you for that list. But if you could come at that next meeting, having read all of this, and be ready to kind of have that dialogue, I think that'd be helpful at that time. And then we have a, um, an initial dialogue on the 15th. I would recommend probably that first meeting in November, which I think is the first. Um, we would actually formally need to kind of vote to submit our items to the town capital planning committee. And then we would wait for our meeting date, which is probably usually go last. So it's usually one of the last Thursdays in November or early December when we would go and um, recommend our projects, talk about what the impact would be for the school department, and then wait until the entire process is done and then we have one final meeting with the capital planning committee where they go and um, make a recommendation that ultimately goes to the town so i know it's a lot of information i just wanted to get that out to you kind of talk a little bit about what we're looking at timeline wise and um, ask you to take a look at that between now and the next meeting questions Jeff? i was just wondering for the high school that's the front parking lot yeah are you adding is the idea to add more space or no. just clean up what we have it's cleaning up okay. and a lot of it is um it's just been patched over the years right. so um a potholes will develop and it'll just basically be a patch um they're not yeah they're not adding any particular parking i do think when it comes to um, striping um you know how the access road that goes out to richardson you get a lot of cars they might do something with just kind of um, marking off or designating some parking spots but no there was no discussion about adding spots it was more just um, repaving and um, repairing the existing, um, well, the all new curbing, but the existing hot top, particularly where it's failed in certain areas. So totally gutting it and putting in new. Okay. And doesn't Gary do um, like a lot of conduit work and, and things that we may not need now? He does a lot of extra work well, yeah, while you, everything is torn up. Too. Well, you have it torn up. So yeah. like one of the things that um, we didn't have the funding for the time to do the lighting at yeah, the high school, or to add irrigation to those islands. Yep because it wasn't part of the original capital plan. But if the roads are already torn up, um, there's not a significant cost in just running the piping underground. Right. So, so they get um, more out of it. Yeah we'd, yeah, we'd run that piping underground. And then this past year, when we had a little money at the end of the year, we actually um, you know, paid for some lighting to go in, irrigation systems to go in. And again, you're not ripping up the paving you just put down. And um, it's a nice way of doing it. So yeah, we would probably do something similar at the, at the high school. So any questions on what we're trying to accomplish for next meeting? Just basically trying to prioritize from last year's list of leftovers and then the 2021 list and then even if you want to look into the, you know, the, the following. And the security kind of broke up over the years anyways, right? Yeah, the security was a three-year project. And I'm going to be honest with you, that's going to be a hard one to, to move around. So uh, just because of the way we phase this project. So this past year we bought basically the, the heart of the system. Um, so we have that now. And we did the installation at the two middle schools. Year two of the program was, uh, and that was a little over half a million dollars. So year two of the um, project was um, going back to the high school. And a lot of the infrastructure is there, but a lot of the cameras are outdated and we need um, newer equipment. So year two, I want to say off the top of my head, was somewhere between two to $250,000. It wasn't as big as the, um, the middle school implementation. Um, and then in year three, that is um, adding the security cameras to all the elementary schools. So uh, that is a number that probably hits the half million dollar mark because I want to say it was about a million and a half in total. Um, and that's why we we're spreading that over three years. So if we bump that, um, we, we can talk about the next meeting, but if we were to bump out that year two of the phase, you're really bumping out year three when you get to the elementary schools. And again, we're sitting on some equipment that now has capacity to add additional cameras and whatnot. And uh, I don't think that is good for us in the long run. Right. So there was a reason why it was broken, broken up the it way was just, it was. It was yeah. the dollar amount was large. Yeah. So if we ever put a million and a half into that in one fell swoop, we wouldn't have been able to really do anything else. Um, so it, and also, it's a lot for our existing staff to take on. So to do a huge implementation like that without increasing staffing, we had to do it so that it was manageable for them too. So I just wanted people to keep that in mind. Too. Okay, one question on fiscal 2021. 20, one of your biggest numbers here is complete remodel of kitchen and food service prep areas 
to include new equipment and furnishings? That's at the high school? No. So if you look at, um, we have three. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, we have three main um, kitchen mm -hmm. facilities that we're currently cooking out of that mm -hmm. need to be replaced. Um, Parker Middle School, McCarthy Middle School, and the high school. Okay. So again, those are big numbers. Those are over half a million dollar numbers. Um, we couldn't do them all in one particular year. Mm -hmm. So in 21, we have Parker. In 22, I want to say it's McCarthy. And then in 23, we have the high school. Um, so that's the way I we've see. broken those down. The two big projects for us next year, at least as listed right now, are obviously if we had to come back and do the parking lot at the high school, that's a big number. Um, the McCarthy Auditorium has been a, a number that's been floating around there for years, and, and that has kept getting um, kind of pushed off. Uh, off the top of my head, I want to say that's probably a $650,000 project. And then um, the Six other big one. Nine. What's that? 669-332. Oh, I don't have it. I'm not looking oh, yeah. at it. That was, that was actually a pretty good guess. That's right here. That's a good <laughs> guess. And then the, um, the Parker Kitchen's got to be about 650 as well. So those, those are some, what's the actual number, Maria? 641 Oh, sorry. Oh, 641? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the thing is, we're, not, we're prioritizing. Um, okay. Five, you know, it's quite a bit of money for that uh, high school front area parking and not getting any new parking spaces whatsoever. Right. Because if you tried to go down during the day to deliver anything to the high school, right. as we know. Um, so for that, how important, I don't know how bad the area is, how much it really needs that renovation. Mm -hmm. Does it at this point? Well, yeah, see, um, it does. And part of the reason we even worked with Dora and Whittier to have them come in and do the study was they were kind of taking an objective look at the entire district. And they came in and actually told us in phases, like, what's an immediate need? You know, what's a one- to three-year need? What's a midterm mm -hmm. need? You know, your four to six years? And what's a little bit longer? So they have obje objectively looked at this as well and said that these are needs that are really priority needs. Okay. So... I think the, qu the question is less, you know, do we do something in, you know, 21 or 22 as opposed to a project that's listed in 2021 or 22 should not be pushed to 30. You know, it shouldn't be pushed out that far. There might be little um, tweaks that happen, even just as we're operating buildings. Something can happen that something rises to the level of you have to bump it up a year. Um, but you wouldn't be bumping some of these projects off like, you know, four or five years. They, they wouldn't have the mm -hmm. ability to do that. But on that, again, like that high school, the front lot, that whole problem may be solved for us if the town meeting votes in the fall to approve that funding anyway. So then that half million would kind of come off the list and we'd be able to focus on primarily the projects we already had identified for 21. And then again, we're gonna internally look because again, we're looking like the two or three years out internally for those projects. We will recommend to you if we think something should be taken out of order. Okay. And that's the dialogue we'll start to have on the 15th. But I would give you all the backup and information if you needed pictures, things like that, just so you could actually see what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, so that's what we would supply to you. Thank you. Right. So Oops. we'll pick this up again next meeting. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure that sounded like a good plan of attack and everyone, you know, kind of had the information and was comfortable. Um, and the last item of the evening for me, um, we did actually have a, I had put a placeholder on there for a field trip, and we did have a field trip come in late this afternoon. Um, it was the, this is an annual event, this is the boys cross country, um, got invited to the invitational meet at, um, in Manhattan. So it's a two day, it's an overnighter on the 13th and 14th. So we're requesting permission for the uh, boys cross country trip, uh, cross country team to attend the uh, Manhattan Invitational on October 13th and 14th in New York. Did the girls go to this or no? Um, that was, I believe, part of the holdup. So the girls are not having any runners oh, no, at this okay. particular okay. meet. So this is just the boys' okay. Okay. I make a motion to approve the field trips as listed. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. All right. Five zero. Thank you. All right. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. Liaison reports. Anybody have them? On September 20th, I went to the CHIPS PTO. Uh, they do great work. They, it's amazing all the activities they have set up for the students and their planning. And they have 
the parents and the PTO have such great relationships with the teachers and Russ and all the in the administration. What they they had this summer, a playground summer meetup at the new playground. They had 40 families show up, and they were really happy with that. And one of the things they're proudest of is the accessible playground was paid for by fundraisers, by chips, and by community ed, and no taxpayer dollars were involved. And it's a wonderful playground. It's yeah, it came out great. Yeah, it's you know accessible for everyone and if they put in a geriatric section I'll be able to play there next year so <laughs> I'm kind of going to push that forward when I yeah, meet he's played with the, with the dinosaur time. already so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I do, I do. But it's just amazing how enthusiastic they are and they do great work I was really happy to be part of it and I'll be going to the high school on Monday for the PTO mm -hmm. Monday and I heard from Terry McSheehy of the Alumni Association and John Sousa sent me an email about the meeting, so. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, so. Great. I Thank attend. you for doing that. Yeah. That was fun, huh? It was. I, I enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> um, I attended the um, McCarthy PTO meeting, and that went very well. They had a very nice turnout. Um, they have, um, they had movie night, uh, which apparently is extremely well attended these days, and that's a wonderful thing to hear. They're going to hold more of their movie nights, so I definitely think we should increase the $600,000 for the auditorium so they can continue mm -hmm. to have their movie nights. Um, no popcorn in the new auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but honestly, what a great group, and they had quite a few new people coming in, and um, look forward to the next meeting. I did bring up the, um, the night that we're going to, the open meeting, Good. and gave them the handout. Okay. Okay, any other liaison? Just some upcoming meetings. The uh, Special Education Parent Advisory Council is meeting on Thursday at 6.30 in the library at the high school, or the Learning Commons. Um, and Parker PTO will also be meeting the same night, um, the uh, 3rd of October, uh, 7 o'clock at Parker. South Row has their PTO meeting next Monday on the 7th at 7 o'clock at South Row. And Byam has their um, meeting on October 10th. At seven o'clock the EL council will be um, part of the open house that's separate for the EL students the EL families and uh, that's coming up at the end of October um, we're going to have a separate table with uh, information for parents who might want to join uh, the council this year and uh, try to attend the state um, sponsored event for this year as well. Um, September 19th, I attended the Biome Back to School Social uh, hosted by the BSA. That was a really good event. They had tons of really good food. Uh, the principal and um, vice principal were both there. It was just really great. All the kids had an opportunity to kind of play and then my son found garter snakes and mm. a bunch of kids were throwing snakes around. So now he knows there's snakes somewhere on the Biome. <laughs> Outside, not inside, it's fine. Um, but no, all, all in all, a really great event, and uh, I can't wait to the next meeting to see how well they did, how much money they raised. But it's one of the better, P not one of the better PTOs. It is a great PTO, though, because <laughs> I don't want to be co competition with South Row. I think they're all good. But, they're all really uh, good. They are. But they the are. other thing I forgot to mention is Family Fun Night is coming up for the uh, McCarthy PTO. And they do, uh, they're going to have the Frisbee golf course available for everybody in the school this year, not just fifth graders, which is really nice. Yeah, it's actually going to be a lot of fun when that gets out. Uh, yeah. When that gets out, we have, have some competitions going on when we get that going. It's committee good. outing. It could be. Yeah. It could be a yeah. school committee outing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Better than I play real golf. So. <laughs> All right. Any new items people want to bring up? Um, just two things. Um, just to, um, we had a couple of things left over from the paraprofessional uh, clerk contract negotiations, and one was to come up with. Uh, we had talked about in uh, principal putting together a um, PD PDs for them. So I know we talked about getting a report about that in the future. Oh, PD, yes. Yeah. And then the other was um, we had talked about um, uh, school by school. A place where they could locate the procedures for the, the that particular school and I just wanted to see if we could get a follow-up on that as well okay anybody else have any new items I had a couple of things um, 
when Hannah Barker is trying to arrange um, to do another taping of Meet the School Committee. Yep. I know we tentatively tried to do something today, but it was kind of short notice. So um, she's thinking maybe before our next meeting, if people can clear their calendars, maybe like an, an hour before or a half hour before, just come in as 10 minutes. Um, you know, just a quick, quick couple questions and be done with it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll love it. Um, the other thing is, I didn't think about this till after I talked to the superintendent about um, this particular agenda, but um, we do have the conference coming up, the MSC conference coming up in November, and one of the things that goes on there is they vote on various resolutions. Um, so I don't know if everybody got the delegate manual that has the resolutions in them. You can also find them online uh, on MASC sites, but if people could take a look at those between now and the next meeting, I put just a, a list of them here. Uh, there's some interesting ones this year. Um, take a look at them, see what, how they're described, and then maybe we can um, decide whether to vote up or down or, or not, neither um, on some of these things. We will have to vote a delegate for the, um, for the general meeting, and that delegate then votes whatever we decide to do in here. So if you could look at them online or look at the, um, the, the delegate manual, and then we can have that conversation next time. Okay. Uh, two other real quick things. Uh, per Donna's request, the uh, assessment of our 2018-19 goals is now online. So on the school committee page, on the goals, um, it's just a document we work with from our workshop uh, where we listed our goals from 18-19 and, and how we thought we achieved those goals. So um, that's up there now if you want to look at that. And then finally, uh, the tracking sheet with item for discussion at our meetings has been updated now uh, for the 1920 school year. So I think right. Superintendent for taking care of that. So you can see our new goals are in there. And then other items to, uh, for discussion you know, over the course of the next year, months, whatever. So if you want to look at that list and if there's something that you think is missing from that list, uh, let us know and, and we'll put that on there. So um, so that's in the, the Dropbox. Thank it's you. in the Dropbox. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. It's just a nice way to kind of track different things you'd like to see. And uh, if you want to, you know, add or just email me, and I can plug them in for you to the email, spreadsheet. Email, because don't add it. You mess up the screen. <laughs> well, I didn't want to call you out, Dennis, but <coughs> had, all right, I messed up the thing. We had a couple of formatting issues last year, uh, but no. If you email me the items you want, I'll plug them right in there. And then it's just a, again, it's a nice little way to kind of yeah. track them and track progress and status. And um, that's nice when we try to do our end of the year report as well to be able to go back and look at all the different things that we've accomplished or what, what's still outstanding. So anything that's outstanding at the end of 1819, I copied into 1920. So those are our first items to work on. Um, I hate pictures, and I hate to bring this up, but <laughs> are we retaking it to include Jeff, or what are we doing? Okay. Right. Oh, the school committee would. Yeah, um, that's right. We should. Yeah. Uh, you know what I, I can do? Um, we usually have O'Connor Studios come into the, to the district for like different picture days and things. And they've even come in to take like admin um, headshots. Let me find out when right. they can come to one of our school committee meetings. And again, we'll tell you just to come a few minutes early and we can take that picture. Just would not want him to miss this opportunity to be on that page. Should we get Thank the student so reps much. too? You know? Sure. Yeah. We'll include the student reps. We can we'll superimpose you. your face over. Uh, <laughs> 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 that could be fine. I'll do it right now. You get a little taller. That's yeah. all. <laughs> but no, that's a good, uh, okay. I'll, I'll make a note of that. Okay. All right, any other items? Okay, um, any further public comment? Okay. All right, so at this point, we were going to co conclude um, the public part of our meeting and adjoin to executive session, uh, discuss ongoing negotiations and litigation. So I'll entertain a motion to move to executive session and not return. I make a motion to adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing, I don't have the paper in front of me. It's um, is it contractual or legal this time? Both, thank you. For the purpose to discuss strategy with respect of collective bargaining or litigation um, and not return to regular session. Second. Second. Okay. Jeff? Yeah. Aye. 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 Aye.